REITs are well known for dividend investing. However, they have risk and reward that you have to account for when investing in each individual REIT. Choosing the best or correct REIT will be able to allow you to reap long-term rewards for your financial freedom. So in this video, we'll look into what are the important factors that needs to be looked at when considering investing in the best REITs. For those who are new to REITs, REITs operate on debts because they cannot keep much cash due to the requirement for their dividend payout to be at least 90%. This also meant that they do not have a lot of income for growth. So there are a few ways for REITs to raise capital for improvements or expansions. Firstly, which is the most straightforward way, is to loan from banks. However, loaning from banks may not be a good choice if the interest rate is very high. Similar to us consumers, the higher the interest rate, the more expensive it is to loan this same amount of cash. Next, the second way is through rights issues. Usually for REITs that require capital for acquisition, they will offer shareholders to buy these special shares at a special price. However, this is also dependent on the share price. Share price is very important for this case as issuing shares at low share price will mean they will have to issue a lot more shares just to get the required amount of cash. This is also one of the reasons why REITs dividends usually do not grow that fast. In order to reward shareholders, REITs issuing shares would usually offer shareholders at a slightly discounted rate. So it's important to get involved to buy the discounted offered price, but that also means that you have to invest more money in them. Next, similar to rights issue, there's another mode of issuing shares, and that is private placement. However, this is only offered to selected investors or institutions. Usually, I do not favor this way of raising cash because this meant that retail investors will miss out on these discounted share prices. And moreover, it will also dilute the retail investors that cannot buy it. Lastly, it's the dividend reinvestment plan. So how this plan works is that you have an option to receive your dividends in stocks instead of cash. So what's good about this option is that it allows you to compound your shares more easily with the REIT. Why is this so? It's because your new shares from the dividend will be able to generate more dividend for you the next quarter. Lastly, after raising all this cash, it's important to check what the REITs are doing with the money. If they're doing the acquisition, they must be dividend accretive rather than just increasing their assets. One of the example is that if the cost of loans is more expensive than the income generated, then the purchase is no good. Next, let's talk about the REITs classes. They are generally classified into office, retail, industrial, healthcare, hospitality, data centers, and diversified. Office REITs, like name says, they lease out office spaces to tenants. If you see, for Kepler REIT being the largest with the portfolio of 9 billion, is exposed to Singapore, Australia, South Korea, and Japan. The next three REITs are under the US, while the last REIT is in UK. For industrial REITs, not only do they manage facilities such as warehouse and distribution centers, they also have high-tech buildings which is catered for specific customers. So if you see, the top three is the most popular ones, with Ascenders rate being the largest at 16.9 billion portfolio, Maple Tree Logistic Trust at 13.3 billion, while Maple Tree Industrial Trust is at 9.2 billion. For Maple Tree Industrial Trust, it's quite unique because I feel that they are slowly shifting towards data centers. Of course, like Ascenders rate, they consist a lot of properties with different classes. Next, for retail REITs, they are essentially shopping malls. The largest out of the group is Fraser Center Point Trust, followed by Paragon REIT and Star Hill Global REIT. With the recent recovery from COVID, retail REITs in Singapore has definitely benefited from the resurgence of traffic. Unlike other countries, because Singapore is a very dense populated country, it's easy for people to go out to shop. So if you can just see by the market cap versus the portfolio value differences, the top 3 has a slightly lower differences. 
while the rest of the REITs in overseas are priced at a cheaper valuation. The cheaper the valuation, the riskier the REITs is to investors. Healthcare REITs are usually hospitals, nursing homes, and medical centers. In the SGX, there are only two REITs. One is Parkway Life REIT, and the second one is First REIT. However, even though they are the same class REIT, their performance have been very different. That's why if you see for First REIT, it's priced at a way cheaper valuation, while Parkway Life REIT is priced very close to the portfolio value. If you are curious, you can watch my video on the First REIT analysis on why it's always priced at a discount. Next, hospitality REITs are typically hotels with the more well-known ones being Capitaland Escort Trust, CDL Hospitality Trust, and Far East Hospitality Trust. Next is Data Center REITs. So Data Center REITs own and manages facilities that house customer service racks, which are used to store, process, and distribute data. They are mostly well-known REITs such as Kappa DC REIT, Digital Core REIT, Maple Tree Industrial Trust, and Ascenders REIT. There are also other REITs that has diversified exposure into different types of properties and they can be seen here. I'll also put the link in my video description for you to access. Regardless of how good or what classes the REIT is, it does not matter when it comes to high interest rate environment. As REITs have to operate on debts, they will always be on the losing end when it comes to high interest rate. So when it comes to debts, there are a few terms that you have to take note of. Firstly, is the cost of debt. Cost of debt is essentially the average interest rate of the debts taken by the REIT itself. Next is leverage ratio, and that is the percentage of debts to asset. Later on, I'll explain more in depth about it. The third term is called interest coverage ratio, and that is how easy it is for the REITs to pay the interest on their debts. Fourth is the amount of loans being hatched, and that is essentially the fixed interest on the agreed loans by the REITs and the lender. Next is the debt maturity profile, which shows what debts are going to expire for the next few years. So diving into the difference in cost of debts, if you see, for different REITs, they have different average interest rate for their debts. One of the main factors in the difference in the cost of debt is the location where the properties are in. One good example is that if you see Parkway Life REIT, their cost of debt is only at 1.04%. Why is that so? It's because they have taken a lot of their loans and properties in Japan. Coincidentally, if you see this table, for the interest rate of Japan, it's at 0%, which is the lowest out of every country. For REITs, which has properties in higher interest rate environments such as the United States, UK, Euro area and Australia. When the REITs take loans in these respective countries, their interests will definitely be higher. Fraser Logistic and Commercial Trust is a good example where they focus on Australia and Europe. So when they refinance their debts in the next few years, I expect their cost of debt to go up from 2.4%. Another factor that will also affect the cost of debt is credit rating. REITs that are smaller and have a lower credit rating will have to take loans at a higher cost. Next, for leverage ratio and interest coverage ratio, they both have required standards that all REITs must meet. For leverage ratio, they must be less than 50%, while the interest coverage ratio must be more than two times. However, REITs will need to ensure that their leverage ratio do not cross 45% as banks might find it risky to loan them money. For my own preference, I would look into REITs which has for less than 40% leverage ratio as a buffer. Why? Because there are times where even if the REIT do not take additional loans, their leverage ratio still can go up because of the drop in the property valuations. If you see this formula, if the debts go up, of course the leverage ratio will go up. But for the assets, it's calculated through property valuations. And if the property valuation drops, the leverage ratio will also go up. So when interest rates are high, naturally property valuations might come down. And that is the typical example for US office REITs, 
where their property valuation has came down due to low demand. This has artificially raised their leverage ratio, thus making them difficult for them to take loans. Lastly, I want to talk about debt maturity profile. If we compare between the three REITs, Maple Tree Logistic Trust, Fraser Logistic and Commercial Trust, and Capital REIT, you can see that for Maple Tree Logistic Trust, for the next few years, the amount of debts that needs to be refinanced is much lesser as compared to the other two, which is above 20% of the debts that needs to be refinanced just next year alone. Especially in this period where the interest rate will remain high, debts that needs to be refinanced will definitely come in higher. This would increase their cost of debt and thus would have to cater more of their income to pay down the interest of these loans. This would of course translate to lower dividend expected. Another important factor to look at when it comes to analyzing REITs are the tenants who are the REITs customers. Now, why is it important is because if tenant collapses, income decreases. So if the REIT has a very large contribution from this tenant and it collapses, then the income will be heavily impacted. Whereas if the REIT has a diversified pool of tenants with low contribution individually, if one of the tenant collapses, the income will not be as heavily impacted as those with concentrated tenants. Now let us see three REITs with three different classes on different tenant concentrations. Now if we look at Keppel DC REITs tenant concentration, the top 10 clients seems to be very concentrated. For data centers, it's usually forgivable because it's hard for customers to actually migrate to another data centers. So therefore, the good thing is that there's a sticky effect where the tenants are actually bounded to the data centers and is not encouraged to move out of it. But because of this concentration, there is definitely risk involved and it can be seen from the recent event with Keppel DC Read where the tenant who is in charge of the three China data centers is unable to pay Keppel DC Read. Based on the list here, it might be the third major tenant which is the colocation provider at 7.8% of the total rental income. That's why you are seeing the effect now when the last two quarters the dividend came in much lower than usual. The next example is a healthcare REIT and that is First REIT. Similar to data centers, it's actually very hard for tenants to hop between hospitals. Therefore, the tendency of losing hospital tenant is quite low. But another issue when having concentrated tenant is that when the tenant has issues or having financial difficulties in paying for the renters, the REIT is forced to compensate with them. This caused the major downfall in first REIT with the base renter not only going down, but the worst part is that instead of collecting in local Singapore dollars, the renters will be collected in Indonesian rupiah instead. This brings about not only lower income but also currency risk to shareholders. The last example will be Maple Tree Logistic Trust. If you can see from the top 10 tenants, it's very different compared to Kappa DC REIT and First REIT. With the top tenant contributing only 3.9% followed by 3.5% onwards. So this actually shows the diversity in the amount of tenants that is contributing to Maple Tree Logistic Trust. In the event if one of the tenants collapses, the probability of Maple Tree Logistic Trust losing income is only from 1 to 4%. As compared to Kappa DC REIT's recent China tenant issue where they have lost about 8% in income immediately. Therefore, looking at the tenant concentration profile is very important when it comes to analyzing REIT. Additional work can be done is to analyze on the individual concentrated tenants. By taking note of the individual tenant performances, you might be able to mitigate this kind of situation. The last factor that I would like to talk about is foreign currency risk. REITs that has overseas properties will always have currency risk. While the typical example is Fraser Logistic and Commercial Trust. If you see their portfolio, majority of their properties are in Australia, followed by Germany, UK and Netherlands. Lastly, Singapore only consists of 10% of the portfolio. 
The REIT has always been performing well with good occupancy and high rental reversions from new tenants. However, in recent years, Singapore dollar has been strengthening as compared to global currency. If you see for Singapore to Euro dollar in the past 10 years, Singapore has strengthened by 19.35%, British pound by 24.3%, and Australia by 31.15%. So when compared to foreign currency, even though the Singapore dollar strengthening is good for us when it comes to spending the money, it's not good for companies when it's converted from other countries' foreign sea back to Singapore dollar to give us as dividends. In conclusion, after going through all these factors, I have came up with a quick checklist when it comes to investing in REITs. Firstly, it's with regards to tenant diversity. It would be good if the top tenants do not contribute individually of more than 7-10% to of the total rental income of the REIT. Next is to look at the REIT's concentration of properties in which country. The concentration of the REITs in certain countries would definitely play a foreign currency risk. Next, the third point is very important and that is the debt maturity profile. This is especially important when it comes to refinancing in a high interest rate environment. Higher finance costs would definitely result in lower dividend for shareholders. And the last line would definitely be the dividend yield. To me, one of the most important factor is that the dividend yield should be more than the local banks. This is because, in my opinion, REITs are considered more risky as compared to local banks. Therefore, by looking at all these different parameters, hopefully this will help when it comes to shortlisting all the good REITs and investing at a correct dividend yield. Thank you so much for watching. As it takes very long to make videos, I hope that you can support the channel by hitting the like, subscribe, and comment on what would you like me to talk about next. You can also watch my previous video where I analyze on the potential of banks as dividends and the best reads that you can consider. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.